Thank you, Andy. Thank you all for having me here this morning. Um, I am Ben Troposis, the Northern California Regional Director of the High Speed Rail Project. I manage the development of the High Speed Project from the Trans Bay Terminal here in San Francisco, south to the city of Gilroy, east to Merced, and then ultimately uh, north to Sacramento, which will be part of our Phase Two project section. I'm actually joined today by Eric Eidlin, who's uh, on loan to us uh, from the Federal Transit Administration who's helping us do some planning in and around our station areas so we're very lucky to have Eric on board to help us. Um, how many Star Trek fans do we have in the audience? Do we have any Trekkies? Good. I figured there'd be one or two of you here. Um, I've taken to quoting uh, Captain Jean-Luc Picard who was quoted as saying, things are only impossible until they're not. And happily, high-speed rail as Mr. Deardon pointed out, is no longer an impossibility here in California. I'm often asked, well, is that ever going to happen? Is, are we really going to build high-speed rail? Well, I'm here to tell you that we're under construction. We are underway. We are building truly high-speed rail in California. And the navy blue line you see here is the entirety of phase one. It's a uh, breakdown of the map uh, Rod showed a moment ago. The phase one program extends from the Trans Bay Terminal here in San Francisco, uh, south, as I said, to Gilroy, east to Merced, connecting with our Central Valley system that is currently under construction. We are turning dirt and building bridges in the Central Valley. It will extend south through the uh, Tehachapis and San Gabriel Mountains, and then eventually into the LA Basin to Los Angeles Union Station and Anaheim. That phase one section will be roughly 520 miles. And for the first time, not only on, are we under physical construction in California, but the remainder of the phase one system is also under environmental review. So the entire phase one section is in meaningful, uh, taking meaningful steps towards completion. The phase two sections will extend, as I mentioned, from Merced north to Sacramento and ultimately from LA Union Station to uh, the Inland Empire in San Bernardino and then south to San Diego, making the statewide system uh, roughly 800 miles. As I mentioned, we're currently under construction. There are four construction packages in the Central Valley that are currently underway, uh, moving dirt, building bridges, m moving a section of the Route 90, 99 highway uh, in the Central Valley, significant infrastructure improvements on our way to establishing the backbone of the statewide <coughs> system. I want to talk a little bit about the 2016 business plan, which has uh, really fine-tuned the direction of the California system. As you may know, the High Speed Rail Authority is required to release a business plan every two years and submit it to the legislature. How the 2016 plan is different from its prede predecessors in 2012 and 2014 is that this is the first fiscally constrained business plan, that is to say we are putting together a roadmap of what we can build with the available funding in terms of putting into revenue service a high speed system in California. The 2016 plan is uh, will show a summary of the work and the progress that we've been able to accomplish over the last two years, shows a clear outline of how we can deliver the system using existing funding, describes the next major milestones and updates all of our ridership forecasts and cost estimates. The uh, business plan itself was released in mid-February. We have a 60-day comment period that is open until mid-April, at which point the authority will adopt the plan and submit it to the legislature. Again, I want to stra stress that this is a roadmap. And the compelling piece of both the business plan and high-speed rail in California is that while the focus is on high-speed rail, it really is about statewide rail modernization and investing in systems statewide. As uh, two of my colleagues will talk to you about in a moment, it's also about investing in, in <coughs> excuse me, existing systems so that they are able to expand their ridership, improve their operations, and eventually connect more efficiently to high-speed rail. Two of them here, our partners at Caltrain that Mr. Hartnett will talk to you about, we're committing $600 million toward the electrification of the Caltrain system, the Caltrain commuter corridor, and we'll be operating within the confines of that corridor uh, very comfortably with the Caltrain commuter system, both high-speed rail and Caltrain, also investing in Muni and in BART and in other systems statewide, the Altamont Corridor Express and the Capital Corridors. So again, about creating opportunities for meaningful connectivity 
um, really seamless connections between systems, giving travelers the opportunity to take transit to transit. So you can get on a Caltrain train at a stop near your home and hop on high-speed rail at one of the stations along the peninsula that I'll talk about in a minute. The three main objectives of the 2016 business plan really focus on initiating high-speed rail service as quickly as possible, taking the funds that we have available, reducing the overall cost to taxpayers, initiating revenue generating service, and providing the opportunity for mobility to Californians that we, we've not had before. Making strategic concurrent investments, like investing in Caltrain, bless you, Thank and you. other systems around the state, ensuring that the system links together efficiently and provides that mobility I just mentioned. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, to be ready for funding as it becomes available. Too often, because of the size of the price tag, bless you, because of the size of the price tag of a project like High Speed Rail, uh, we forget the investments that we make in other in modes of infrastructure and the costs associated with those. But um, in order to provide the equivalent transportation capacity that high-speed rail is going to deliver to California, we'd be building over 4,300 new lane miles of freeways, 115 new airline gates, four new runways, with none of the associated environmental improvement or greenhouse gas reductions. And those investments would cost two to three times as much as the $64 billion that high-speed rail is going to cost us. Um, as I, I said to, to Jim and uh, Ed earlier, is there anyone who thinks we'll put another runway in the San Francisco Bay? Anyone? Yeah. So some significant challenges uh, toward producing that. And really, to Rod's point, with none of the associated greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction, that's a, a very compelling piece of this. So position the, the system to accept funding as it becomes available to, to complete it. It had always been the notion of the state and the authority that high-speed rail would be joined by a private partner to complete the system. Looking at the private sector to, to join us in completing the investment in the statewide high-speed system. And as is the case for certainly transportation infrastructure anywhere in the world, the only way that private investors get in the game is only after there's been a sustained and significant public investment in the pro project itself. In California, that investment is really cap-and-trade funds, and cap-and-trade has served as an opportunity certainly to accelerate the program and deliver it sooner rather than later, reducing the overall cost of taxpayers, but importantly, it serves as the catalyst for that private investment, and last year we released a request for expression of interest to the private sector. We got significant feedback over 30 firms and sovereign entities like JR East and others, um, <coughs> excuse me, or rather Japan, Spain, Italy, other countries expressed interest, but companies like JR East and others uh, submitted interest. Uh, likely toward the end of this year, we will release a request for a proposal to solicit actual proposals for private partnership in completing the statewide system. So it's a, a very much focused toward that kind of private sector participation. A couple of the highlights of the plan include the fact that the overall cost of the system has gone down from $67.6 .6 billion in 2014 to just over $64 billion now. The schedule for the system is still that the phase one system is expected to be under revenue service by 2029. The shift is that uh, the 2014 plan was focused on extending the construction in the Central Valley south to the Los Angeles Basin. Instead, uh, we're now looking at developing revenue service from the Bay Area to Bakersfield to begin revenue service, uh, certainly from uh, San Jose and Silicon Valley, but ultimately from here in San Francisco uh, on very much the same schedule by 2025 to begin revenue service operating trains from the Bay Area to the Central Valley. And at the same time, investing over $4 billion, con continuing to invest in Southern California and improvements between uh, Burbank and Anaheim to prepare that part of the system for ultimate connection when we get from Palmdale into the Los Angeles Basin. Uh, the document, as I mentioned, is uh, available for public comment. That period ends in mid-April. And there are a host of ways. I invite you to all get on our website, the uh, authorities' website, and take a look at the business plan. And certainly, if you have comments, we'd be happy to hear those. 
and you can do that on the website itself. Just briefly, the project that we're looking at in the Bay Area and the project that we're moving to environmentally clear by December of 2017, which is a fairly ambitious schedule, we're moving the uh, analysis forward as quickly as possible so that we are able to move that uh, Silicon Valley to Central Valley system forward as quickly as possible. Looking to connect through, as Rod mentioned, the Pacheco Pass into the Central Valley, connecting here roughly eight miles east of Los Banos, where those systems are currently under construction. The stations that we're focusing on in the Bay Area project sections include the Transbay Transit Center, which is beautifully under construction right downtown here in San Francisco. And if you have an opportunity to stop by that construction site, I invite you to do that. It's really an impressive site. Uh, piece of infrastructure that, that's going up. Uh, we'll also, for a time until we make the connection to the Transbay Transit Center, be likely operating out of the 4th and King Station that Caltrain currently operates out of. We'll have connections at the Millbrae Station. Uh, that, that will be the connection to San Francisco International Airport. Uh, the team at the airport likes to refer to us as their third runway, an opportunity to create connections for travelers in the Central Valley. And uh, the San Jose Deardon Station, um, I forget who it's named after, but um, uh, that's going to be a significant regional multimodal facility where, like San Francisco, will connect to Caltrain and to BART and Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority light rail and buses and regional buses, a significant uh, node in terms of both transportation and an opportunity for economic development and de densification in and around the station. And then lastly, but certainly not least, Gilroy, the city of Gilroy is planning a station in its downtown where we've partnered with the city of Gilroy to do that. And Gilroy in its own right can become a significant node for connections south to Monterey and Santa Cruz and San Benito counties um, uh, where Travelers can come to Gilroy to catch a, either a regional system like Caltrain or ultimately high-speed rail. Again, the Bay Area section extends from San Francisco along the Caltrain corridor. We'll be operating, once fully electrified, up to six Caltrain commuter trains per hour per direction and up to four high-speed trains per hour per direction. The uh, Mid-Peninsula station that's shown here was considered originally as a possibility for a station given the density of high-tech jobs in that area and it's certainly from a commuter standpoint a very possible a popular rather destination where significant riders from both San Jose and San Francisco ride to the mid peninsula to those jobs but we've determined as our analysis has gone forward that it doesn't make as much sense from a statewide standpoint so we'll not be taking the study of a mid peninsula station further through our current environmental analysis. Having said that, it doesn't preclude us from sometime in the future if ridership dictates and demand dictates for us to work with those peninsula communities, cities like Palo Alto, Mountain View, Redwood City, at the possibility of having a mid-peninsula station there someday. I'll just note that the San Francisco to San Jose project section is different in that it is a fully blended system. It will be a fully blended system where both uh, like many international examples, both high-speed trains and local commuter trains will operate on the same infrastructure, staying largely within the existing Caltrain right-of-way, all with a mind toward minimizing the impacts of expanding service. But that really is the point of the blended system. It's not about commuter or high-speed. It's about expanding the capacity of the system and investing in Caltrain and giving Caltrain's commuter system, the opportunity to expand is about expanding capacity, getting people off of Highway 101 and giving them the opportunity to really um, move in a way that they've not been able to. Uh, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, 400 of the largest companies in the Bay Area, surveyed their CEOs and every one of those CEOs said that traffic congestion is still among the top five issues that their companies face in terms of remaining economically viable getting their employees to their jobs, getting goods to market, getting people off of 101 and the delay that's experienced by their being stuck in traffic is significant to their businesses and their ability to do business. And so creating additional capacity in that Caltrain quarter is hugely important and really um, the game changer for us in terms of the statewide system.
Some of the improvements that we're looking at as part of our follow-on analysis for blended service includes looking at things like safety improvements in the quarter, making track adjustments, grade crossing uh, improvements and ultimate grade separations were appropriate, station improvements, storage and maintenance, passing tracks so that the trains can function more efficiently through a blended quarter. And then as all large infra infrastructure projects require significant amounts of uh, community outreach and participation and ensuring an opportunity for the local community to give meaningful input to the development of the project. From San Jose to the Central Valley, roughly an 84-mile corridor extending from San Jose south to Gilroy. East through the Pacheco Pass, we will have roughly 12 miles of tunnels through the Pacheco Pass getting us to the Central Valley. And as I mentioned, the stations in that portion of the line will include San Jose and the Gilroy station. Jobs are a central component of a large infrastructure project like the High Speed Rail Project. And in California, it's already had a significant impact. Uh, you see here just the Bay Area Council number on the Caltrain electrification project alone, the 9,600 jobs and all over $2.5 billion in economic activity that will be generated by just that project. So follow on high-speed rail will add to that. And we're talking both construction jobs and post-construction operation and maintenance and station area um, jobs that will be in place that currently don't exist. And it, and that's really the advantage to the statewide system is that providing that point to point, downtown to downtown travel opportunity and creating activity centers at those station locations, not just transportation locations, but really commercial and retail opportunities for uh, diversification of the economies in cities like Merced and Fresno and Bakersfield that haven't previously had that opportunity. And finally, I'm primary tenant of the high-speed system in California is an emphasis on small business in California, ensuring that small business in California has a meaningful opportunity to help construct California's largest infrastructure project. The authority has a 30 percent small business goal, but it really is a mandate. We've really worked hard to ensure that the prime contractors that are working on our system include small business, and to date there have been over 266 small businesses in California that are helping us deliver California's project, and that's going to be our ongoing ethic as we move forward. So it's a very exciting time for high-speed rail in California. It is now moving from an impossibility to very much a real, not just possibility, but reality, and I'm very excited to be a part of that. <coughs> I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yes, sir. I'm just interested to know a little bit more about the operating characteristics of each of the sections, particularly the operating speeds. Sure. Through most of the urban areas, the speeds will likely be in the 110 to 125 mile an hour range. Uh, as you might know, the Federal Rail Administration doesn't require great separations until you get to 125 miles an hour or over. So in the Caltrain corridor, for example, we'll be operating both commuter trains and high-speed trains at 110. That's what the passing tracks are required so we can ensure that we're moving trains around, that uh, we're not delaying Caltrain trains, and that Caltrain's local trains aren't delaying any of either the Baby Bullet or Ultimate High Speed trains operating in the quarter. But we'll be at 110 there. Uh, in the more open areas, you begin to go 150 and 180 in more rural, but in the Central Valley, the high end of the system will operate at better than 220 miles an hour. 30 minutes from San Francisco to San Jose, 2 hours and 40 minutes from San Francisco to LA Union Station, um, roughly an hour from San Jose to Fresno. So significantly shrinking the state and creating economic opportunities just by connecting the economic centers both north and south more effectively to the Central Valley. Other questions? Yes, sir. And what's the impact in your mind of the uh, LA to Vegas? Oh, uh, thanks for mentioning that. My apologies for not pointing that out when I had the map up. The uh, light blue line you see here is the Express West Project, a privately uh, organized train that's looking to serve the market from the high desert to Las Vegas. 19 million travelers a year on I-15, and we're looking at making a connection with the Express West at Palmdale, and eventually providing a one-seat ride from Las Vegas to LA Union Station. So working with Express West to put to accommodate interoperability 
on our tracks uh, once we get into the LA Basin, making that connection at Palmdale, but uh, really mo connecting our system uh, as seamlessly as we can to Express West. That's a huge market and a great opportunity to uh, give travelers from throughout the state that can hop on high-speed rail and get there using Express West as well. Your opinion, when do you think they might start service? Uh, that I don't have as much detail on. They uh, are still, uh, like all of us, trying to cobble together funding, but um, uh, it would certainly be our hope that we'd be able to be in the 2025-2029 time frame so that we're beginning service together. Yes, sir? Hi, so uh, I'm thrilled that the Bay Area has moved forward, um, and this should have been done 10 years ago, um, and I'm a big enthusiast of high-speed rail, and I'm curious about CEQA. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned that uh, the corridor is still being reviewed. Mm -hmm. And my question is, uh, what stage is it at? Is it at scoping? And in the scoping, if, if, if you have any indication of where are some potential issues raised that may delay this past 2017, which I don't want to yeah. see, but I, I am very familiar with you. Sure. Jim, do we have that kind of time? I don't think we have <laughs> yeah, uh, You have 12 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, the, the Reader's Digest version is uh, we are in scoping. We'll actually have uh, begin scoping in earnest in the San Francisco to San Jose section. We have uh, the HNTB team is our environmental engine and engineering firm for the Bay Area sections. It's uh, a single firm, but two documents are being produced. So for San Francisco to San Jose, we're going to go through scoping, and that'll be in May. But we're still on a schedule to have a record of decision by the end of 2017, December 2017, in both project sections. In San Jose to Merced, we've already gone through scoping in a significant way through the process because uh, we really have a limited number of alternatives, really, in both sections. In San Francisco to San Jose, we'll be operating the Caltrain quarter. That's pretty much it. So the analysis will really focus on those additional elements in order to accommodate higher speeds in the quarter that we'll be focusing, focusing on. So the scope of analysis is much narrower than, say, a full built-out facility. In San Jose de Merced, the alignments are largely set. We'll be looking at um, at-grade aerial and underground through the Erdogan Station. We're going to work hard to be at-grade south of San Jose to Gilroy. And then from Gilroy east, we'll, there will be some viaduct sections, but it's largely tunnel to get to the Central Valley. And those are, for the most part, the alternatives for analysis. So we're not going to spend a lot of time going through 15 or 20 different iterations of alternatives. So that really helps save time, really focus the analysis, allows us to work a little more efficiently with our resource agency partners and make sure that they're comfortable with uh, the direction that we're going on the project. So our expectation is on both sections will be done by December of 2017. Yes, sir. Can you just clarify that you said the Giridon Station scoping, that part of it will be part of the uh, San Jose to Merced section? Yes. Uh, Peninsula section? Yeah. Other questions? Great. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here.